Fireside Chat, Episode 15, recorded April 30th, 2013. The season that was. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat, featuring Dan, Matt, and Lucas. Welcome back to another episode of Fireside Chat. I'm Dan, as usual, alongside Matt and Lucas. And as we record this, it's April 30th, which means it's the start of the first round of the playoffs. NHL playoffs are always exciting. Which series are you guys looking forward to? I'd like to see the Islanders beat the Penguins. I would as well. I, I think, uh, you know, I, I never get to watch the Islanders for obvious reasons. Uh, I'm curious to see what uh, John Tavares is capable of. I I want the Pens to win that series, A, because I took them in my playoff pool, but also because Jerome's there, and I figure if we're going to trade Jerome, he might as well pay himself off with the cup. That's the whole reason they got rid of him, sent him to a contender. He can do that next year. A draft pick's involved. (laughs) Yeah, and and you know what? He can do that on his own. It's, it's, It's not up to us. We did our part. Any other series you guys think is interesting? I want to see the uh, Toronto-Boston series, just because it's been a while since we've seen Toronto in the playoffs, and it's an original six matchup. Those two teams always play well together. I'm really excited. To, I'm really excited about four straight ga- or if it goes seven, potentially four games of sixty minutes of thank you, Castle. <laughs> what a great cheer! Do you guys think the Sharks will choke again this year? Yeah, I don't see them beating Vancouver, even though I don't see Vancouver going past the second round. I could see San Jose beating Vancouver. San Jose, despite the fact that they've never cashed anything in, you know, consistently makes it two and three rounds deep into the playoffs. And you know, Yeah, it's just... it just depends on what version of the Sharks shows up. <laughs> That's the whole problem. No. <laughs> Indeed. Although N- Niemi apparently, I saw some highlight package on. I think it was Sports Center a couple of weeks ago about Niemi for Vesna, and I-, I don't know if I'd buy into that. But if someone thought enough to produce it, he must be doing better than I imagined. Definitely. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't really followed him this year. Yeah. So I mean, you know, he's he's got a Stanley Cup, and he's he's been better than I think people give him credit for. Because I think everyone feels Antti Niemi gravy trained his way to a, a camp a championship on that Chicago team, but well, the thing with the thing with Niemi is that his glove hand is weak, and usually that's like the strongest aspect of a goalie. So that's where it leads into the you know he sucks category. But the rest of his game is positionally sound, and he does all the right things. It's just he can't catch properly before. So, I'm also going to suggest, and this is another thing that makes me crazy, but I'm going to suggest that because Antti Niemi's pads are so bloody straight, it makes people think he's not particularly athletic, and thus it, it gives them the perception that he's not as good as his job, because frankly, he doesn't look as stylish as goaltenders with better fitting or cooler looking pads, and you might think I'm insane, but look at Antti Niemi's gear and look at other goalies and tell me who looks like Archer's Urbe and who looks like a badass. True. Yeah. It's, it's you know, it's perception is, I don't know, 90% of reality, isn't it? Yeah. Well, Urbe was one of the coolest goalies in NHL history with the lovely, well-worn pads. <laughs> mm-hmm. I had street hockey gear that looked better than Urbe's gear. Well, apparently he used to run over his gear with his truck to break him in. <laughs> wow, I didn't know that. This was back in the day, though, when everything was made out of leather and you actually had to do that. True. As opposed to the stuff now where you can wear them for half a practice and it's like you've worn them for six years. True. Like Martin Brodero, I think it was last year... It might have been last year in the finals. Martin Brodeur just shows up middle of the playoffs, new set of pads. That's unheard of it prior to recent technological developments, obviously. All right. well, this week was green garbage bag day for the Flames, the day they all come in to clean out their lockers, do their exit interviews. And there's been a lot of stuff posted on the website, all of the uh, 
videos with the guys they're leaving, Jay Feaster's exit interview. I think the most interesting thing for me was uh, Feaster's exit interview. And I know Lucas has watched it, Matt read about it. Anything really stand out in that to you guys? The only thing concern that I have is that they might be rushing things a little bit. They their prospect pool for the Flames is not exactly that great. And like they really need three prospects from the first round this year to really get themselves back into having some actual talent. And I worry if they like trade it one of the picks for a player or, you know, try to trade up by trading both of the picks, it might, you know, be detrimental. I don't know. I, I think if you if you trade one of the picks to either move up in the draft or to uh, acquire some sort of RFA talent, then so be it. I, I think that's, you know... It's... Yeah, I'd be fine to move any one of them. I wouldn't move two of them in one package, but I'd be willing to take any one of our three picks in the top 30, package them with maybe a roster player, and you know, move up a couple more picks to get a better player. Yeah. Well, well, if, uh, say, like the Flames traded Giordano and the St. Louis pick for one in the top 10, I wouldn't complain about that. But, you know, if they're going to trade like redo the Ryan O'Reilly thing like that might not be a good idea no and uh, something I was thinking about just now um, what if you trade like because I think this is a lateral move at best and it probably hurts you um, trading the St. Louis pick and Giordano say back to St. Louis for Kevin Shattenkirk I'm not a fan of Shattenkirk yeah, I, I personally, I think he's redundant on our team. He's another skilled, small, yeah. offensive D. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't give up Giordano and the first round for Shattenkirk. I like him, but he's just... It, it, with TJ Brody, it, it's kind of having too many of the same thing. Speaking of TJ Brody, congrats from all of us at Fireside Chat. TJ's off to represent Team Canada in the World Championships. I got the sense looking... Yes, congratulations, by the way. But I got the sense looking at uh, Canada's World Championship roster that there's a lot of guys on that team who are there because they want to go to the Olympics and they think they're on the bubble. That, to me, is the only reason guys like Giroux and Stamkos are there. Going back to Feaster's, uh, Feaster's chat, one of the things I thought that was interesting that came out of that was that he pretty much said he wanted to do the rebuild the way I hope they do the rebuild. It doesn't sound like he wants to go out and do what Edmonton did and tank for three years, get the first overall pick for three years, bring in those young players and build around that. They want to kind of rebuild on the fly. They want to try and ice as competitive a team every year as they can, it sounds, and put young players into that mix and slot them in as they can and let those guys develop and then take over more key roles going forward. Yeah, I'm not really a fan of that idea because of the fact that I think that you need to suck a bit to do things properly. Because, like, if we're always picking in, like, the 7th to 10th spot for the next, like, say, three years, well, you're not going to get an impact player. Like, this year's a bit of an exception because it is a little deeper. But in an average draft, like, the, those type of players aren't exceptional. And you're getting more, like, quality second-line guys, maybe. It, so, you know, it, we need one at least really good franchise-caliber guy, like a Giroux or a Stamkos or a Crosby, something. Well, I think you could tank for one year and get that, but I don't think you need to do what the Oilers have done and do it for consecutive years. Oh, no. But we, you know, it's like with what they were saying about going, trying to go back to the playoffs and that. Like, that's... That, I think, is unrealistic. Yeah, and if you're going to be making moves to try to do that, like, you're just going to end up stunting your own growth. And as we've seen with the Toronto Maple Leafs, they, they've basically been trying to do that exact thing. 
And, you know, they missed the playoffs the entire time between the two lockouts. So, you know. Here's the thing, though. Um, whether, like, whether or not they um, want to, uh, I guess, accelerate their rebuild, the, the reality of the situation is the team is going to, they're going to have to play a full 82 games next year, and with the amount of youth and inexperience that's going to be in play, they're going to be probably a bottom five team in the league again. They don't have the horses to go through an 82 game season and approach the playoffs. They like they don't. I don't care who we draft this year, I don't care who we pick up in free agency. It's just not there. Yeah, and unless we get Crosby or something for a fifth round pick, then yeah, no. <laughs> so so I mean and with that so with that said, I don't know that it's necessarily a concern that they that they they are talking about not tanking for three and three or four years like the Oilers, which and I, I think they should because you should always be trying to improve your team and you should be capable of that in in a manner of speaking. The Oilers have tanked for three years because the Oilers front office is incompetent, not because that I, I don't think there was a directive to uh, to suck. No. Yeah, I agree with you, Lucas. I would never want to hear from my team that our directive is to tank and get the pick. Oh, no. I think really when that happens, as much as as fans we like it because it gives us a good piece, it's a WTF moment. What went wrong to get us in this spot? Oh, yeah. Well, with what I was arguing, like the thing is that, as Lucas was saying, like no matter who we pick up, like we're not going to be a top team. It's just I want... I'm worried about them possibly making moves trying to accelerate things when it's not beneficial. Like, say, like the O'Reilly trait or offer sheet and stuff like that where you're kind of setting yourself back a bit. Yeah, on the flip side, though, you have to look at the O'Reilly trade in a completely different light now the O'Reilly, the O'Reilly trade was or the O'Reilly trade the offer sheet was done at a time when it was that to me was Feaster's last Hail Mary to try and keep this core together and not blow it up uh, if they get O'Reilly I don't think they trade Jerome I don't think they trade Bo I think they go all in and assuming they kept him obviously but that's to me what that move signified that is not I don't think the way the front office is going to do business going forward because they've got no real reason to like who are they gonna go and throw either a first round pick at to get or a ton of money none of these guys are i guess um no one they could acquire is in that echelon of player that they think could help them immediately turn around I mean, even looking at the O'Reilly trade now, when we look at what assets the Flames have, and everyone thought it would have been such a bad idea to give up that first-round pick, even if they did go ahead and trade Jerome and Bo, we would have had that pick back, or not that same pick, but we would have had another pick in the first 30. So, I don't know, I still am of the opinion that the O'Reilly signing wouldn't have been a bad thing. It would give us a young centerpiece for this team, and a centerman, that I think they could use to build around for a couple of years. Yeah, if if it would have worked, and there's the whole wave of thing, and there there were reports that the NHL would have let the Flames have him or something, but I, it's it's all a moot point at this point. All I'm saying is, I think the front office's mindset is completely different from when they made that offer sheet, and of course that raises a different set of questions, like why is this front office so flaky? I don't think they're all that flaky. Well, I mean, you could argue just based on, okay, they're going to go out and try and make this big splash offer sheet a 22-year-old center, give up a first and a third, and then a month and a half later, again, has gone, Bo's gone, uh, and the team is tanking. Or, or the, the team is, you know, icing half an AHL roster. So it's like, what's, what's actually your plan here? I don't know if they're flaky or if they're more desperate. I mean, they're trying to find something that works. Well, I know, but that's the thing. Desperation is not 
good for a front office. Like I, I personally, I'm under the impression. I, I've always felt that um, any GM who does anything that could be construed as a save my job sort of trade should be immediately fired. Uh, because look at look at it this way: there's what three or four GMs in the history of the league that are probably unfireable, and you have to ask yourself. Are you one of those three or four guys? Uh, and, and See, what, I never saw the O'Reilly signing that way. I never saw it as his last-ditch effort. Well, it was a last-ditch effort of sorts to keep the old core together. Yeah, but I never saw it as a way for him to save his job or you know anything like that. I, I just thought it was a creative move, and he was looking for something. He needed a centerman. It was worth giving a shot, and it didn't work, so let's move on and try something different. I, no, I, I understand that, but you'd said they're desperate. So I mean that. Well, I thought desperate is a better word than flaky. I don't think they're desperate, but I don't think they're flaky either. I think based on the examples you gave, they're just desperate to find something that works. Yeah, I, I, and, I, 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 I good. And like that's why I'm a little concerned about like him saying that we might be moving picks for players or, you know. Like it, well, I think Jay said they're open to the idea, and I think you have to be oh, yeah. open to the idea. If you if you go into the draft saying I'm not going to answer the phone if anyone calls, oh, no. I think you're doing a disservice to your no, team. No, that's stupid. You listen to everything. It's just that, you know, it's a little worrisome when there's been some acts of desperation lately, and you know, you'd like to see a calm, cool hand in things, not. Yeah. You would, but he, how, how about this? Um, Jay, the good thing is, Jay Feaster said the sixth pick is not going anywhere unless it's in a move to trade up. So that's good. Uh, secondly, you can either... What, what you can do with the luxury of having three first-round picks, you can either take your three first-round prospects and be happy, or you can flip, say, the St. Louis pick for... Uh, a restricted free agent player, and then you trade down with the Pittsburgh pick to pick up a couple second rounders or something, and then that way, like you've accelerated your rebuild a bit. You've got a young, talented piece, and you've got some secondary prospects. Like second rounders usually have some good upside, but they've got a flaw or two, what one way or the other. So I mean, if they only had one first round pick, yes, they, then I think they they'd be I'd be worried. Uh, as it stands with three, they've they've got a lot of options open to them. Obviously, let's not spend too much time dissecting the draft. We're going to do that over the coming weeks. Each week for the next three weeks, we're going to look at each one of the Flames' first round picks and the players that might be available there and what they might do with that pick if they don't draft themselves. So you can stay tuned for those episodes over the coming weeks. Good tease. Looking at, you know, the this season and, you know, Green Garbage Bag Day for the team is their chance to come in and reflect and talk to the media. And I want to know from you guys, we talk a lot about the negatives of this season. But what do you see as positives coming out of this season? The youth. Yeah. I think we've had a great youth movement. I think uh, TJ Brody's really come along. I'm liking the progression on guys that I don't think we would have seen up here otherwise, like Reinhardt. Um, I like Hanowski. I think that Berchi is much more confident. In his exit interview, he even talked about wanting to be the Jerome McGinley of this team going forward, that centerpiece guy. So, yeah, I think that the youth... And the fact that they were winning games when they needed to be losing at the end of the year, I think, shows they are progressing. And that, to me, is the best thing that come out of this season. Mm-hmm. Beating teams that had more to play for than you and frankly exponentially more talent than you uh it's it can't be anything but a positive a draft position aside uh and as far as positives i mean it, for for a uh a 24th overall team um they put together some of the more uh exciting games we've seen in several years and some of the prettiest goals that was good. And, you know, as much as everyone talks about this year and how bad it is because we're in sixth overall spot, the Flames have drafted in this spot three times in the past. So it's not like this is a new thing for us to be drafting this low. It hasn't happened in many years, but we've we've been in this spot before. Yeah. It didn't feel good then either. 
No, we've never cracked the top five. Thankfully, if you want to think of it that way, we've never been that bad. But we've drafted three times overall in six. We don't have a great record drafting in the sixth overall position. We've taken Rico Fata, Dan Kachuk, and Corey Stillman. But we've been in this position before. Yeah. Well, with Stillman and Kachuk, both of those picks were good. Kachuk only got derailed due to concussion issues. So, you know, it's kind of hard to harp on for that. And Matt ignores the fat of move. Yeah, well, that was a dumb pick, but... <laughs> yeah, hitting the mark two out of three times, because I do count Kachuk in that, that's not bad. So if we can hit the mark again with either of the players that... well, I, I think you'd have to be stupid not to be able to hit the mark this year. Yeah, there's eight good guys this year, so we're in the top eight, so we'll get one of them. Yeah, I'm looking at the the, the uh, 2012 draft. Sixth overall was Hampus Lindholm. So, who knows? Maybe we'll get back-to-back Lindholms at six. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to go back and... Uh, I'm on Wikipedia now, just having a look at various drafts. 2011 sixth overall pick was... Uh, Zabazad, I think. Zabinajad, yeah. He's all right. Yeah. A lot, lot of Swedes go sixth overall. Yeah, and Sam Gagne was a sixth overall pick. So, you know, there's usually a quality guy. That Brett second Connelly. line. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Brett Connolly was 2006, or 2010. Uh, Jeff Skinner went one pick after him. Ooh, uh, oh, another Swede in 2009, Oliver Ekman Larson. Yeah, and that was a good pick. Yeah. So, you can, so there's lots of good players still available at six. Is what we're saying. Yeah, yeah it's it's not quite as bad as our history. Oh no, Nikita Filatov. And this is a very deep year too. So. Yeah, Nikita it's not like 2007 or you know like one of those years that really had a issue with depth or talent. Another thing I'll throw out there is a positive for this team this year. I think is the coaching staff. I've really liked what Hartley's done. I think he brings a refreshing change behind the bench. He's not one of Sutter's guys. He brings a different look at the team. And I feel like everyone on the on the roster, on the playing roster, has been more open and comfortable this year. We saw the best years we've seen from them as Flames, from Bo Meester and Stajan. And the rest of the guys just always seem more relaxed in their interviews. They talk more positively about their coach. Yeah, well, even Stempniak led the team in scoring. So, you know, he did have quite a positive impact on the team as a whole and was getting more out of the players. It's just that the team itself did not have enough to, you know. Yeah, but you can't fault that on the coach. No, and I'm not doing that, you know. You you can only get so much blood out of a stone. So, but I think he got everything he could get out of what he was given. Yeah, especially in a situation where he had no training camp, uh, shortened season, playing every other night, limited practice time, and they're all excuses. And excuses are well, no excuse. But you know, people who wanted to see Hartley axed after forty eight games, every coach gets more than forty eight games. Unless you're like John McClain or something. Yeah. Well. Yeah, I think we have to give Hartley a full season at least next year to see what he can do with the team. Well, the thing is, is that like with John McClain, the Devils were actually a good team, and the coach was taking away from that. But Hartley, the team wasn't good, but he got more out of it than they should have. Yeah, so. and. And people will talk, uh, point to Columbus and uh, the Oilers and teams that fired uh, their personnel at, at various points, uh, at Colorado. Uh, organizations that have had several years of failure it, with that group in leadership, of leadership in place, yeah, you can fire them after a 48-game season. A guy coming into a completely unmanageable situation uh, gets more than half a season. Yeah. Well, especially on a roster that's been known for a long time as being uncoachable, and now they think all those players, maybe besides Giordano and Kipper, that were here during that time and were said to be part of that uncoachable core are gone, I think you have to give Hartley some time to put his stamp on the team and show them how he wants things done and let them respond to that. Yep, and they will, which is good. 
I think he's the right guy. I really do. I really like Hartley as the coach. He seems positive, too. It's so nice to listen to post-game interviews with him because he doesn't seem like Sutter where he's just always upset with something. He actually seems positive, and he's you know trying to have a good time, which is always good to see. Well, he, yeah. also, has, he also has the ability just to achieve some intonation in his voice. I mean, yeah. Bob Hartley talks like this, and he's always, you know, he's got some emotions behind his words, and you can... He always makes some of the funniest but silliest analogies, too. Yeah. And it makes things a uh, lot more interesting, anyway. Brett, yeah, it does. Brett Sutter's and and I think it brings a passion that the fans can get behind, right? You want to get behind a guy who's positive. Mm-hmm. And you know, as opposed to you know Brent Sutter going up at the podium every day doing his Harrison Ford impression, you know, just like, uh, well, power play is not good. How is it, uh, goals. Uh, Gimless well, it's interesting you mention that because, yeah, Sutter has always seemed would lead with the negatives. And it seems like when we listen to Hartley or any of his staff, Jelena or anyone that they talk to, um, even, you know, Conroy, they all lead with the positives now when they're doing an interview. Mm-hmm. Here's the things that were good tonight. Mm-hmm. And it's also. And I think that's what you have to do. you got to encourage your team. Yeah, well, and there's something to be said for, you know, not looking at an interview with your coach and wondering what's so fascinating on the floor. <laughs> Yeah, true. Um, another good thing is that um, he has been, and the other coaches have been going through with the players, especially the young players, and pointing out what they're doing wrong, and like actually like teaching them, like this is how you exit the zone or whatever. Yeah, you know, and being a more calming influence. The coaching staff's also talking about actually visiting some of the young players during the off season to make sure that they're eating right, training properly, and making sure the off season isn't a time when they turn off, which I think is a really good idea. Yeah, well, plus like we've heard that like John Gaudreau eats very poorly, so you know, having you know making sure that that doesn't happen with every player that's on the team might be a good thing. For sure. And I think one thing Feaster talked about in his press conference was specifically with regard to Michael Backlund, but he talked about young players just being, uh, you know, the coaches are willing to teach young players as much as possible, but it has to be a two-way street. And he singled out Backlund as being a particularly enthusiastic student. And I think that was pretty evident in his game as the entire season progressed, injuries aside. By the way, do you, let me ask, ask you guys this. Michael Backlund, is he a core player? Yes. Is I, he? Okay. I think his personality is what does it because he does have a leadership style persona. And, yeah, he is very talented. He can, when we're coming out of the rebuild, he'll likely be a second line winger. But, you, you don't know. think he sticks at center? No. How come? Uh, well, we have Jankowski, and we're likely going to draft a center this year with our first pick. And if you're getting more, you know, like Backlund, could, he's more skilled than a third liner. So I'd ship them over to the wing. He's defensively responsible, so... Well, and that could be a good thing to have, too, is a winger who you can slot in at center when somebody gets hurt or you need him on a special team or something like that. I could see him play wing and then, you know, center on the penalty kill or something. Yeah, and, like, if you have... Realistically, we should have six centers on the team, so that way injuries and all that kind of stuff. Like, I'd also have say like Roman Horak, him being on the wing as well just for that reason and he can slot in at center when necessary yeah I mean it, it's you know, center depth we've been screaming it all year yeah and the more centers that we get like honestly if we drafted three centers this year in the first round I wouldn't be complaining too hard you can never have too many. I mean, look at I mean, this is a hor- semi horrible example, but how many people on the Olympic team in 2010 were natural wingers? There was a Ginla, Moro, Heatley, 
Nash, I guess, as well. But I think everyone else almost was a center who was just playing on the wing. Yeah. And having that versatility will help especially like in the future playoffs and that because injuries do happen and you know having the ability to have a guy just slot back in that center you know anything helps <laughs> yeah the other thing that feaster referred to that we've talked about in his uh i guess if you call it his exit interview uh, was the need for more grit. And he mentioned, he didn't say him by name, but he pretty much said that the last summer they tried to go after a guy who's played here before who could fit into that. Um, and everyone thinks it's Brandon Prust. So the team tried to go back to Prust, and they are recognizing they need the grit, which we've talked about. So I think that's a good thing that they've identified that as a key piece going forward. Yeah. So uh, should get ready for a new set of Nystrom jerseys then? Yeah, no one's wearing 23 right now, are they? No, I don't think so. All right, nope. good. Nobody's wearing 23 right now. And you know what the good thing is? The Flames jerseys are on sale right now because they just went out of the playoffs. I saw a couple stores send me a 50% off flyer. So now's the time to go get your jerseys customized. Oh, I should, I'm going to have to do that. I might um, as well. <laughs> yeah. I, I just bought myself a uh, th- one of the third jerseys, the classic jerseys, because I hear they're going to be gone next year. It's on sale for 80 bucks at Jersey City, so I figured I'd grab one before they're gone. Good call. Jersey City. Um, for all your jersey needs, that'll be $58. <laughs> So, looking back at the team, positives and negatives, anything else that really stuck out to you guys this year? I mean, we don't want to necessarily... We've harped on a lot of it already, but just in kind of a brief summary, anything else that you want to mention? I think one of the major positives is finally we moved on from the Jerome Aginla era and can, can move forward with, you know, a new group because having your franchise player being 35 is not going to set you up for anything good. So, And you know what? I'm not as freaked out about the idea of Mika Kiprasov retiring as I thought I would be when I thought about it a year or two ago. I think it's, as I've said before, I think it's the right timing. If this team's rebuilding, now is a good time for Kiprasov to bow out as well. No arguments here. We thank you for your service, number 34. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, Forever if he flame. comes back... Next year, I'm not going to be upset, but, no. you know, if he goes, you know, I wish him all the best, so either way. I think another positive this year was Steve Bejan. I mean, he's a guy that nobody expected to make this team, and he managed to stay here all year. And when you can pull those kind of guys in that, you know, are pleasant surprises like that, I think that's always a positive, too. Yeah. Well, I recall on the first show that uh, Lucas was harping against his inclu- possible inclusion, and I recall I had said that it, I wouldn't be surprised if he was here. And you know, I'm glad. Yeah, that... I thought I thought he was going to be a first call up, but he was going to spend most of the year in the AHL. Oh, I'm just glad that we had him in that leadership style once the rebuild occurred because he does have a good work ethic and you know that's necessary to teach you know young impressionable people so yeah I'll go with that I'll stop I'll stop berating him I don't think he should be wearing number 25 but clearly nothing is sacred to this organization Damn the other it. thing I was happy to hear in the exit interviews was McGratton said he wants to be back, and he said he never wanted to leave in the first place when he didn't come back a couple of years ago. So that might help fill that tough guy role. With, if there's a guy who wants to be here, make sure he's here. Yeah, and with him, I'd be fine with him continuing right through the whole rebuild because we need mm-hmm. somebody to make sure that nobody picks on any of our young players. Yep, and he can play. Yeah, sort of. He's got some skill. He, he set a, a new record for himself this year for number of goals. He's got uh, three goals this year and no assists, and that sets a new career record, I believe, for number of goals in one season for him. You know what? And if he wants to stay on this team going forward, he needs to be less selfish with the puck. Yeah, I agree. 
actually all three of his goals were pretty good for somebody that's not known for that kind of play. Well, there was that one where it just, it's sort of like, it was it was a nothing goal against Columbus. It was a crash the net sort of thing. But that one against Anaheim was a thing of beauty. Yeah. It was George out. Per- deked out Sure, beat him in a foot race. It was George Peros-esque. Should we wrap it up for this week, guys? Yes. Before we do, I want to let our listeners know about a new contest we're going to be running. We've talked about some of the unanswered questions so far on this show, and I know there's a lot more. Um, On our Facebook and Twitter pages over the next couple weeks, we're going to be asking burning questions. Short questions that I think a lot of people still want to have answered or might want to have some feedback into. So we're asking the Sea of Red to go to firesidechat.ca and then find our Twitter and Facebook pages from there and answer any of our burning questions you see come up. We'll have more details on the site, but there's actually going to be a contest around this. And one person will be chosen at random who responds either on Facebook or Twitter to one of our questions. And we have a Flames prize pack for them. It's got a Flames hat. It's got some uh, autographs from the Flames picks from last year's entry draft. And whatever else we can throw in there. So more details will be on firesidechat.ca. But we hope you'll go to Facebook or Twitter, whichever one you prefer. uh, Follow us. Like us. And then start answering some of those burning questions. Let us know. Is it herpes? (laughs) Not those kind of burning questions. (laughs) And as we teased earlier in the show, the next three weeks we're going to be focusing each week on one of the Flames' uh, first-round draft picks, the players that are available around that pick who the Flames might take, and other things they might do with the pick. So we encourage you to to check in over the next three weeks to hear those shows as well. We're really looking forward to doing them. Actually, I shouldn't speak for my co-host, but I'm really looking forward to doing those. And we think they'll be a lot of fun and get everyone prepped for the draft. Stop speaking for me. You're not excited about them? No, I'm, 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 I'm fine. I'm, I'm excited. So until next week, happy playoffs. Let's hope we see some great hockey. Please lose Vancouver. <laughs> Suck it, Tom. Oh, we are the boys of chorus. We hope you like our show. We know you're rooting for us, but now we have to go. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson.